Good morning. It is the 14th of September. It's about 8, 10 in the morning, and I'm going to come with you today with the video for the Ancient India Lecture. And I'm also going to have the instructions for the source evaluation as well. And I'll keep this short like I do usually. That way you actually will hopefully watch it and, and pay attention. And the very first slide here, we got the geography of India. Uh, uh, the geography of India, it's very diverse, as it says here. You've got a uh, highland peninsula. You've got mountains. You've got rivers. You've got uh, rainforest. You've got some desert. You've got a little bit of everything here. The most important features, though, are going to be the Himalayas, which are the mountains at the top, the Ganges and the Indus rivers, and then the Deccan Plateau, which is going to be the southern part of India. Uh, the Indian subcontinent is also more than just the modern-day country of India. You also have to consider um, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, a little bit of Afghanistan, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, a little bit of China. So it's a lot more than just the modern-day country of India. The Indus River Valley is going to be where civilization starts in this part of the world, and there are a lot of similarities to the other early civilizations we talked about. There's a lot of similarity to the, the uh, people of the Mesopotamia. There are a lot of similarities to the people of the Nile as well. Uh, the big differences, though, are going to be around the idea of religion. The very first people are going to be the Harappans. Uh, their civilization is very old. We estimate somewhere around 33,000 BC to 2000 BC. But they're very recently have been rediscovered, like early 20th century. We don't know a lot about their writing. We cannot read it. Uh, we have used a lot of our best guesses and archaeology to come up with our, our ideas. So our view of the Harappans may or may not be right. It's something that we are still trying to wrestle with and work with. It looks like it's a city-based civilization as we have found hundreds of their, their villages or cities, including two large ones, one called Mohenjo-Daro, the other one called Harappa. And we have found that their cities and their villages are all laid out very similarly. Uh, there's their houses without windows. They have a courtyard. There's a central citadel where it looks like they gathered water and, and maybe met. Uh, they have religious temples, uh, public bathhouse, and even sewers and possibly running water. It looks like their weight system was the same no matter where they are. Their measurements were the same no matter where they are. And it looks like they use the same thing for money because we find like coins and tokens everywhere. As Archaeologists have gone through the layers of their remains. It looks like they haven't really changed a lot over time, meaning that they didn't have a lot of outside pressure. They didn't have any reason to change. Another suggestion, though, is that they had a strong leader that prevented change. But whatever it is, we just we don't know the answer, and we're still looking for that answer. Based on other people in the area, they were probably a theocracy, though, meaning that they were led by priests or the priests had a very heavy influence in their society. And we think it's probably an agricultural economy because we find evidence of farming and we find evidence of things like barley and wheat and peas and even cotton. As far as religion goes, we think that their religion is probably related to Hinduism. Uh, there are a lot of similarities between early Hinduism and what we find in Harappan um, remains, such as statues and figures of bulls. So we think that the bull or the cow was sacred to them. Now, ultimately, we don't know what happened to them. Uh, there are some suggestions. One suggestion is a change in climate, possibly desertification, soil erosion. Uh, it could be that the weather changed. We also have a theory that there was some sort of calamity, like an earthquake may have changed the course of the river or deforestation. Um, but there's also a suggestion that maybe they were invaded and just couldn't fight off the invaders. Uh, whatever it is, though, we, we actually don't know. All right, if we were live in class, I would play this, but um, it doesn't make sense to play it.
while you're just watching the video. So we'll skip it. And we'll go straight to the Aryan invasion. Now the Aryans were nomadic people. They weren't urban like the Harappans. And they came from the area that today would be southern Russia or Kazakhstan or any of those Caspian Black Sea areas, uh, Georgia, Armenia, something like that. They are an ethnic group, but they're not a cultural group, meaning there are different cultures mixed in, but they all live a similar lifestyle. So they're not all the same ethnicity, but they do have a shared culture, a shared way of life, and um, you know a similar language. And interestingly enough, their language is related to English and other European languages today. They probably traveled in small bands. We think that they probably moved because they had cattle and they needed it to graze. And their culture and their history is primarily known through books called the Vedas. And these Vedas are going to tell us about their early history, their early religion, and their early belief system. So what we know about these Aryans, or Aryans is that it's a warrior culture. And they had a very strict class-based society that's going to develop into what we know today as the caste system. So I got the classes listed right there and you see the priests are at the top, then the warriors, merchants, the everyday worker, and then a group called the untouchables, which I'll mention more here in just a moment. The Aryans, they're going to come in and they're going to take over the part of northern India where the Harappans used to live which is where we get the idea that maybe there was invasion. Um, the Aryans, they attempt to ban racial mixing, meaning the Aryans and non-Aryans can't mix. And the non-Aryans are probably going to be the remnants or the descendants of the Harappans. Today, they're known as Dravidians. Hinduism is going to develop and uh, Hinduism, it's the oldest surviving religion in the world. It is as old, if not older, than uh, Zoroastrianism that I talked about a couple days ago. And um, that's because Hinduism has no true beginning. It just it develops organically. And there are even some people who argue that this is not even a religion. In fact, the original name of Hinduism was Sanatana Dharma or the eternal religion and if you ask for a founder if you ask for a leader there is not one and if you ask for the holy book there's really not one uh, there are some important books though the Vedas are going to be holy texts in addition to texts about culture and history and the Rig Veda is going to be considered the oldest book in the world it was written somewhere around 1500 BC and it's a book of hymns uh, there are over a thousand hymns, and uh, the longer the hymn, the more important the deity or more important the topic is. Uh, the Rig Veda was originally memorized and then handed down from generation to generation. Another important book in Hinduism is the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita, it's a book of traditions. It's going to contain most of the the earliest Hindu traditions that have developed and continue to develop today. It was originally written in Sanskrit as well. And the most important or the most well-known part of the Bhagavad Gita is the story of Prince Arjuna, which is something you have to read for this week. Uh, long story short though, Prince Arjuna, he's challenged to do the right thing. He questions himself and he is going to eventually do the right thing for his people. Uh, finally, there's a poem called the Mahabharata. It's 200,000 lines long, and that was going to be memorized as well. So what were the original beliefs of Hinduism? Uh, originally, um, well, let me start here. Hinduism is a unique religion, if you call it a religion, because it's both monotheistic and polytheistic. It depends on how you practice Hinduism as to which path it takes. And part of this comes from the fact that some Hindus see their supreme being as a single deity, a single entity, 
while other Hindus see their deity as made up of multiple parts or multiple deities that kind of form together. So um, it's really interesting as far as how that goes. The fact that some people see their deity as a supreme being who breaks into other parts, while others see the supreme deity as a sum of multiple parts. Now, if you're somebody of the Christian flavor, think of this kind of like the Father, Son, Holy Ghost thing. The Trinity makes up um, the deity in Christianity. So that's, it, that's the best example I can come up with. Another thing that's important in Hinduism is that uh, everything works in a cycle. And time, it's not a linear thing. You can... You can be reincarnated, so to speak. You can come back and you can have a second chance in a way. The entire thing is based on the idea of truth. You are constantly working towards the truth, the meaning of life, so to speak. Um, as far as the different parts of the religion, you've got the Atman, which is the soul. Uh, you've got karma. Uh, but karma is not the what goes around comes around idea that we think of today. Karma is more a balance of your, your actions and inactions. Sometimes taking action is good. Sometimes taking action is bad. Sometimes not taking action is good. And sometimes not taking action is bad. Uh, so your karma, it's more like cause and effect. What does your action or inaction do to the world around you? Is it a positive interaction or is it a negative interaction? The Atman, the soul, and the karma, the measure of your soul, um, all comes to samsara, which is the idea of reincarnation. And that's where your karma and your dharma are going to be measured in your atman, in your soul. Now, what is dharma? Each of the castes, the brahmins or the kshatriyas or the the, um, the vyasa class, if you will, the, the different castes, they each have a particular way of life they're supposed to follow. They have certain rules, certain regulations, certain foods, you name it. And Dharma is that set of rules. So when it comes time to be judged, your actions and inactions will be judged against how well you lived up to your expectations. That's the idea of reincarnation. Hindus have four basic goals. That's to live up to their dharma. That's to have artha, kama, and then eventually reach moksha, which is the release of the soul, the release of the atman from the cycle of reincarnation. Speaking of castes, here's a very poorly done graphic on the castes. Uh, each of these castes is going to have its own dharma, its own code, its own way of life. And dharma, it determines everything about your life. What you can and can't do for a living, who you can and cannot associate with, who you can marry, where you can live, even what you can eat. In the caste system, there's no mixing. You cannot mix class. If you are a non-Aryan, you cannot mix with an Aryan and vice versa. And then there is this special group called the untouchables or the pariahs. They are not seen as part of the caste system because they are down so low. Uh, typically, if you are considered a pariah or an untouchable, it means that you are viewed to have done something so bad in a previous life that you cannot be redeemed. Uh, pariahs, they are the ones who do the dirty work. They're the ones who do the undertaking, the sewer digging, the leather work. The stuff that nobody else can do, the pariahs, on top of being untouchables, are considered unclean, too. Now, overall, Hinduism doesn't spread much. Uh, its it spread is a fairly modern thing, uh, but traditional Hinduism, it spread basically to Southeast Asia from maybe Afghanistan to Singapore or Indonesia. It was originally believed that to be a Hindu, you had to be born a Hindu. That has changed a little bit over time. And you do find Hindu temples throughout the world today. Um, because of where Hinduism is found, it is a large religion. Roughly 15% of the world's population will identify as Hindu. That is over a billion people. And here in the United States, there are something like 2.5 million people who identify as Hinduism. 
And the most unique thing about Hinduism, because there is no one founder, there's no one book, there's no one way of life. Hinduism is always changing. And Hinduism evolves based on local cultures, local traditions, and local ways of life, which is part of why it is considered more of a philosophy than a religion by many. All right, um, moving on really, really quick. Source evaluation, that is due this week on the 19th. And here's what I need you to do. If you haven't seen this list of instructions, they're located in the essay folder, but I'm just gonna break it down real quick. What I need you to do are look up four or five sources that would work towards your research paper. Uh, so go back and look at, and remind yourself what your topic is, and then try to find four to five sources that would work with your topic. Uh, you can come to the West Georgia Tech Library, you can look on Galileo, you can look on Google Scholar, and you don't have to read the sources completely. I just need you to flip through them and answer some of these questions. The first question I want you to answer has to do with authority. Tell me how you found your source and whether you think the method you used to find the source was good or not. Then tell me who the author of the source is and do just a little bit of research on the author and decide if that person counts as an expert on the subject or not. The second thing I want you to do has the topic of objectivity. Just decide if your source is fact or if it's opinion. And then tell me how you made that decision. Finally, Accuracy and currency. For accuracy, look at the sources that the author used. Do the sources the author uses look legit? Uh, does it look like they've done a lot of research? And then currency, tell me how old the book or the article or the source is. Is it up to date or is it old? And tell me if you think that it is new enough to be useful. The whole idea of this is to get you thinking about your sources and to decide what a good source is or not. So just once again, authority, tell me how you found the source. If you think it's a good way to find a source, tell me who the author is. And if you think the author is an expert. Objectivity, tell me if the source is fact or opinion and how you decided that. Accuracy, look at the sources. sources. Does it look like the author has put in a lot of work and done a lot of research? And then currency, is it a recent source or is it an old source and why might that be important? All right, any more questions about the source evaluation worksheet and what I expect you to do, send me an email. Be happy to help you out. And I look forward to seeing what you come up with. I'll talk to you soon.